thanks for having me to present this talk. Um, so uh, I titled this Platonism, Nominalism, and Theoretical Virtue, but in retrospect, maybe I should have titled it Platonism, Nominalism, and Explanation. But theoretical virtue is still going to play a big role in what I talk about. So I'm going to start by discussing uh, what's been called the explanatory indispensability argument. So this is kind of an updated version of the standard Quine-Putnam indispensability argument. Um, the idea is that this addresses some of the contemporary um, things that have come up in philosophy of science, like maybe we should only be committed to the entities, like the physical entities posited by a theory as opposed to some of the um, theoretical commitments describing those entities, various qualms that have been raised about how much we should be committed to specific parts of scientific theories. So um, the way that I'm representing the argument is with these three premises. Uh, you can find elements of it in Alan Baker and Mark Coley. But, um, so the first premise is scientific theories constitute the best explanation for empirical phenomena. Uh, like collectively the different sciences. Second premise is Platonism plays an essential explanatory role in scientific theories. Uh, third premise is one should accept whatever plays an essential explanatory role in whatever best explains empirical phenomena. Conclusion, one should accept Platonism. Um, so the idea being here that whatever caveats you might put on the parts of scientific theories that you should accept, Certainly, you should be, um, you should at least accept the parts of the theories that are explanatory. And then they will point out um, places in different theories where the Platonistic commitments uh, do play some explanatory role, like maybe aspects of number theory uh, are relevant to uh, explaining some empirical phenomena. So um, I'm going to reject three. So I'm going to say that even if Platonistic scientific theories display uh, theoretical virtues to a greater degree than their nominalistic counterparts, we shouldn't endorse them in the final analysis, even if at first glance, prima facie, they're preferable. So when I talk about theoretical virtues here, I really mean sort of intrinsic theoretical virtues, things like uh, being simple, having relatively few primitives, being consistent with what we already know, uh, those kinds of things. An extrinsic theoretical virtue might be like being true, being the explanation in fact. Obviously, if we were talking about best explanation in that extrinsic sense, the argument would be plainly uh, question begging. Uh, you know, what's in dispute is what's the correct explanation, right? Not the, uh, not something else. So um, I'm just going to throw that out there as a caveat to make clear what I'm talking about. So unlike some nominalists, I'm willing to grant the possibility of there being empirical evidence for Platonism. Um, one response to this argument comes from Kenneth Boyce. He gives a kind of counterexample to the general principle that you should accept the explanatory parts of the best theories um, that doesn't have to do with Platonism. And then says that given that the general principle is wrong and given that we have strong kind of intuitions to support the idea that empirical evidence can't support Platonism because they're causally inert. It doesn't seem like the abstract objects are causally inert, I should say. It doesn't seem like they can uh, play any role in making things happen in the physical world. Um, I, my, my rejection of three is based on different grounds. I'm perfectly willing to concede for the sake of this argument that we can have uh, empirical support for Platonism on the basis of um, theories in which Platonism is used, um, having a good explanatory account of empirical phenomena. So why do I reject three then? So the first thing I need to do to elaborate on my reason for rejecting uh, that third premise is to introduce what I'm going to call the non-compete principle. So uh, for any P, Q, and R, and by the way, I'm going to give a concrete example of this soon, so um, it won't stay on this purely abstract schematic kind of level, which can be you know, hard to remember, right? 
But um, for any P, Q, and R, these are just sentences. If that P is sufficient to explain why R, and one knows that P, then one is, not in, one is not entitled to infer the Q from that Q being able to explain why R. And the thought is that's true even if Q is a better explanation of why R than that P. Better explanation in the sense of being a simpler theory, um, being you know, not ad hoc, um, all the different kinds of intrinsic theoretical virtues that I was talking about, having more of those than the alternative theory. So one qualification, which again, I'm also gonna point out in the example, because you might have objections stirring in your mind already. This doesn't mean that um, if P is sufficient to explain why R and Q is sufficient to explain why R, one is never entitled to infer the Q if one knows the P. It just means that the basis on which one infers Q is not the fact that it explains why R. It has to be some different reason um, that serves as the ground for thinking that. So let me um, bring up my example to kind of motivate this general principle and demonstrate what it's saying. So suppose you discover it's wet outside. You walk outside your front door. Um, there's water everywhere in the neighborhood. You know, it just it's just wet. So one explanation is that it rained. Another explanation is that someone um, drove around with a sprinkler mounted truck and sprayed water everywhere. So prima facie, uh, first glance, of course, that it rained is a better explanation. Uh, it's a simpler hypothesis. You know that it rains quite often, whereas my guess is in your neighborhood, it's very rare, if ever, that a, a big truck comes by and just sprays water around. But um, now suppose you have a security camera. You're very worried about thieves, whatever the case may be. You have some sort of security footage. And you look at the camera footage and you see that a truck did come through and sprayed water everywhere. Well, now you don't have a reason to believe that it rained on the basis that it explains why your environment is wet, right? You already have an explanation of why the environment is wet, even if it seems um, uh, very complicated and convoluted or strange or bizarre given what typically happens. Um, you know that it happened and it's sufficient to explain the environment, the condition of the environment. So you don't have any reason to infer that it rained. That doesn't mean though, that you can never believe that it rained, right? Because maybe you turn on the news and you see the meteorologist talking about how it did in fact rain in that morning. Well, then of course you should believe that it rained, but the basis for your thinking that would be the testimony of the expert not the need to explain the fact that the environment is wet. Okay, so why does the non-compete principle, what does this have to do with my rejection of three? Well, what I'm going to suggest is that when you look at the details of nominalistic alternatives to Platonistic scientific theories, even though they're kind of more convoluted and have some theoretical deficiencies compared to the Platon Platonistic counterparts, um, the principles that they rely on are things that we have independent reason to accept already. And those theories are sufficient to explain all the empirical phenomena that the Platonistic theories would explain. That's where I'm going with this. So by the non-compete principle, that would undermine the reasons that we would have to affirm Platonism on the basis of uh, its usefulness in explaining empirical phenomena. Okay, so what kind of theories am I talking about? Well, there's many different nominalistic theories. I'm just going to uh, describe one from um, Jeffrey Hellman's paper, Structuralism Without Structures. So, um, the details are quite complicated. I'm going to give a brief kind of account of what is going on there. That's certainly not going to fill in the details, but it can kind of convey uh, what assumptions are at play in developing the account, and then also give you a bit of a sense of how complicated it turns out to be. 
So Hellman shows that it's possible to reconstruct fourth order piano arithmetic out of a continuum of symbols. So uh, you start with classical Mariology in, a, in an infinity of symbols. From that, using the techniques of Burgess, Hazen, and Lewis in the appendix to parts of classes, um, you can construct ordered pairs uh, just purely Mariologically and with uh, plural quantif quantification. There's three different ways of doing it described in the appendix. Um, they're all fairly complicated. One of them involves splitting up uh, the infinity of atoms into three different parts and taking two atom fusions um, and then using a series of quantified claims to uh, convert all this into claims about ordered pairs. I'm not even going to pretend to go over the details of that, but it is relatively complicated. Like the method of double images, which is the most commonly cited one, uh, involves like a series of six quantifiers and the various claims that you end up making to talk about ordered pairs. But once you have the ordered pairs, you can then interpret claims about relations in terms of them. So the idea would be anytime you make a claim about a relation, you're in fact, um, using plural quantifiers and plurally quantifying over the ordered pairs. So if you think of relations as sets of ordered pairs, you're instead talking about the plurality of ordered pairs that would be in that set if you were thinking of it as a set. Okay, once you have, um, so then you can say, once you have relations, that some, that some simples satisfy the axioms of a complete separable ordered continuum where one of those plurally talked about relations, some ordered pairs, plays the role of less than. Then quantifying over fusions of simples gives the effect of quantifying over sets of reals because the, the simples in that continuum play the role of reals. And then fusions act like the sets, right? They have extensionality, all those features that you would like. You can reduce relations getting singular entities. Uh, back into the equation to count those relations rather than using the plural stuff. Um, you can reduce relations um, to sets of reals using this Burgess, Hazen, Lewis technique that we were talking about. If you, following the technique, it's gonna turn out that, I mentioned that there are those two atom fusions, for example. Um, well, if the simples that you're talking about are all playing the role, they're, they're playing the roles of the reals, um, then any fusion of those two atoms is gonna be a fusion of two reals, which you're treating as a set of reals, right? So uh, you can take fusions of all of those things and that's gonna effectively be the set of the ordered pairs. Um, so <clears throat> once you have that in place, then plurally quantifying over fusions of simples gives you the effect of quantifying over sets of sets of reals and relations between sets of reals from which you can talk about relations between reals. So there's a lot going on in this construction. Um, now, what does this have to do with physics? Well, first of all, notice that we can get a continuum of simples that satisfy these axioms of a complete separable ordered uh, continuum just by uh, having a substantival of space time. So the space-time points will be enough to provide you with that continuum. The second thing is we know from the project of reconstructive mathematics, uh, reverse mathematics, that second order piano arithmetic on its own is sufficient to uh, construct most of the mathematics, probably all the mathematics really, that you would need to do science. Um, so fourth order piano arithmetic is certainly going to be powerful enough. So you can think of it this way, take a given Platonistic scientific theory, reconstruct its mathematics out of a piano, second order piano arithmetic, uh, using that as the foundation. And then you can take that theory and then construct it out of this kind of nominalist construction that Hellman is providing us. And combine that with the empirical content of the theory, and you have the nominalist theory. Okay, so 
I have to concede, right, that Platonistic physics seems to have um, greater theoretical virtue than this nominalistic alternative. Uh, and therefore, at first glance, we should prefer it to the nominalist alternative. Why do I say it has greater um, intrinsic theoretical virtues? Well, it is a lot simpler. So I hinted uh, before that these different pairing methods that we find in the uh, appendix to parts of classes are quite complicated. Um, you know, if you don't, if, if you want to look into the details, just take a look at the appendix and you'll see what I mean. You don't have to go through any of that if you're just working through this Platonistically. Um, also, I think the Platonist theory involves more modest primitives. You just need for second order arithmetic in a Platonistic setting, a notion of successor, addition, multiplication, and order. Fairly modest stuff. Whereas to build um, fourth order piano arithmetic nominalistically, um, you need the full resources of classical Mariology and plural quantification. So, and classical Mariology, right, that's, um, that's quite a commitment. It, it, it entails, for example, that there's an object composed out of the tip of my nose and uh, a star, uh, one of the, the furthest star in the Milky Way, for example. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot that's, um, a lot of commitments in there. I think in the same paper, Hillman also talks about um, how you could just construct second order piano arithmetic out of like a countable infinity of simples. Um, and even, even that still invokes the Mariology and plural quantification. So I mean, don't, I need to double check that before I say that with absolute certainty, but I believe he does talk about that as well. So you still have a lot of commitments, even if you just stick with the less expressive foundation for math. Um, okay, so it seems to be maybe less virtuous in those intrinsic respects than the Platonistic theory. But I say due to the non-compete principle, nevertheless, we should not hold that Platonist physics is the right explanation for empirical phenomena. The reason being is that we already have reason to believe in the principles that nominalist physics uses. So there's already independent reason to accept classical Mariology and primitive plural quantification. So you can think about the argument that there must be an extreme answer to the special composition question. So the idea is if there were any moderate answer to the question of when some things combine to form a whole, uh, that would entail that there's metaphysical indeterminacy. That's a classical argument. And then, so that leaves you with nihilism. Things never compose holes, or you get universal composition, which is the most robust commitment of classical Mariology in terms of its controversialness. And then you can argue against nominalism on the grounds that it's inconsistent with gunk, or it's inconsistent with our existence, given that people appear to be composite objects. Primitive plural quantification, you can just say, well, it seems like when I talk about uh, the people going to the theater, I'm not talking about a set of people secretly. I'm just talking about concrete individuals, the people. Um, Space-time substantivalism is commonly thought to be supported even by Platonistic physics. So uh, you can think about how it's convenient to think of gravity as like distorting some kind of as being a distortion of a substantival space-time by massive bodies and things of that nature that people often cite to kind of help support substantivalism. But all you need to get nominalist physics, as I've described it, is classical Mariology, primitive plural quantification, space-time substantivalism, and then the particular empirical content of the theory which is shared with Platonistic physics already. So that's just a shared commitment. And if nominalist physics is true, it just explains every empirical phenomenon that Platonist physics explains. I mean, it, it constructs all the requisite math and has all the same empirical content. So of course it's gonna explain all the same things. Um, so plug this into the non-compete principle. You can just let P be Anomalous physics is true, QB Platonist physics is true, 
and R be some conjunction of all the of all true empirical statements or all the empirical statements that you're trying to explain in any case. Um, so <clears throat> by the non-compete principle, we're not entitled to infer that Platonistic physics is true on the basis that it explains the empirical phenomenon. And of course, if we're not entitled to think that, it, seem, it doesn't seem like we should be entitled to think that Platonism is true on the grounds that uh, platonic commitments play some essential role, uh, essential explanatory role in Platonistic scientific theories, right? The, the pressure to um, believe in Platonism on the basis of that essential explanatory role is grounded in the pressure that we feel to accept the Platonistic theory to begin with. Uh, if you don't accept the Platonistic theory and you think there's other explanations, then you, could, you, you have no reason to think that Platonism is true uh, because of whatever role it plays in those theories. Okay, so um, how much time do I have? Let's see. I guess I have enough time. Um, so the, the big thing then as a concluding thought is, you know, you might be off the boat very early with this. Um, maybe you don't like classical baryology. You don't think that those arguments in, in its favor are very good or very convincing. Maybe you don't think primitive plural quantification is the way to go. You prefer to think of plural quantifiers as being secret quantifiers over sets. You're a space-time relationalist, whatever. You might be, so for various reasons, you might uh, reject the idea that we already have good grounds to believe in the commitments of anomalous physics as I've talked about. So even if that's the case though, I think that there is a more general kind of um, principle or idea to draw from this. In general, Nominalists will often use principles that there is at least supposedly already good independent reason to accept. Um, the theories that they develop might not display theoretical virtues to as great a degree as Platonist theories, but nevertheless, if they're true, they're sufficient explanations of the empirical phenomena that the sciences want to explain. So if one endorses the principles that nominalists use, there is no reason to endorse Platonism on explanatory grounds. The big picture takeaway from all this then is that if one is going to critique nominalist theories, the grounds for the critique should be on their metaphysical and philosophical presuppositions, not on how convoluted they are or complicated or, or the different features of them that make them kind of less intrinsically attractive than Platonistic theories. And since I've only described one particular way of nominalistically going about uh, constructing a scientific theory, um, you may not like that particular theory, but there are other options out there that you might want to explore. Maybe you like Charles Chahara's uh, constructability approach. Um, you know, he has a theory where he says you can reconstruct um, mathematics that are talking about what open sentence tokens are constructible. Um, you know, any, there's any, several different options that are available. So um, the right way to criticize the different accounts is to criticize their metaphysical assumptions. And if you don't like the metaphysical assumptions of one nominalist theory, you might be on board with the metaphysical assumptions of some other nominalist theory. So, um, I guess that was my talk. I mean, I, I feel like I went faster than I expected to, but I guess that leaves time for questions if anyone has questions. Yeah, thank you, Jack. We have about six minutes for questions. And as I can see, Jason would like to ask. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, that was a great talk. I. Um... I think I had a couple questions, but I'll just ask the one. Um, when you first outlined the non-compete uh, principle, um, and you had the the yeah the example with the the car uh, the yeah um, 
I, so, so, so it was it, the, the point, the point I'm trying to make is, is it's a, it's a know that P situation. It's when you mm-hmm. know that P, uh, but, but then it seems like when we get to the case for nominalism, it's look, yeah, classical muriology, we're all all right mm-hmm. with that. And it, it's more like, we have good reason. It, it's, it seems like a slight switch. And I don't know if this is more terminological or substantial, but, but um, it does seem like there, there's the switch from, it's when you know that P to when it's like, uh, P, P seems pretty good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree. It's like, even people who feel very confident about their mariological assumptions might not want to say that they know that those assumptions right. are true. Right. So I think the next step for me to thinking through this is to think about um, what tools could like formal epistemology or just reasoning probabilistically play here. Mm-hmm. Because I would think that if let, let's say you're like 80% confident in the conjunction of the assumptions, maybe that's maybe even that's quite high, but let's just say you are. Um, mm-hmm. If you have like a really low prior probability in the existence of platonic objects, like I don't know, arbitrary low number, one in a five thousand or something, prior to any kind of evidence or something, then I would think that the fact that the Platonistic theory is more elegant in some ways still wouldn't raise that probability, the, the probability of Platonism much higher given that you already think that there's like an 80% chance that there's an explanation of the empirical phenomena uh, on the basis of what you think is likely to be true with 80% confidence. So uh, in that case, I feel like maybe it would still be some evidence for Platonism, just not very, uh, that the theories are more elegant and stuff, but maybe not very, uh, not very strong, depending on how confident you are in the nominalist kind of assumptions but yeah i mean definitely when i think through this in the future i'm gonna have to look uh deeper into like okay how does this look if we try to hash it out in bayesian terms or something what really what would be the details there so yeah i agree with you and that's kind of the next thing on my agenda (laughs) cool yeah great that's all i wanted to mention okay Any other questions? I mean, if there is time, I do have a second thing. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, So when, I I, I guess I just want to connect it to like the actual, um, some of the actual debates that go on with the sort of indispensability people. I mean, my advisor is one of them, Chris Pincock, I don't know, but, um so yeah right so second order piano arithmetic is in some sense like it's sufficient for science but i I guess like when i read um baker on cicadas or something i think that if i it's been a long time but like the paper is like look no here's this like number theory fact that is essential for the explanation Mm -hmm. and then i guess this is just a clear for clarification question Are, are you saying like Oh, that same number theoretic fact, Baker, we can just say the same fact, but instead of referring to the number 17, like some prime number of cicadas, I don't know, but but instead of referring to the number 17, we refer to this surrogate that we get through the myriology and the space-time points. Is that, is that just the move? Yeah, that's, that's the move because the thought is, I mean, the general thought is, maybe this is controversial, right? But my thought is like, well, it is sort of the underlying structure that's the key explanatory thing. So if you can recover the kind of the natural number structure, um, the presence of anything that satisfies that structure, so to speak, or for which that structure obtains Mm -hmm. would have the same kind of explanatory role. like anything that kind of a, the natural numbers could explain, if you think of those as just platonic objects, mm-hmm. um, could also be explained by things by kind of 
where the same structure obtains. So maybe that could be questioned, but that that's certainly like something going on in the background. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.